Hello, good day and welcome everyone to the launch of this uh, DOSI 10 year anniversary webinar series. Uh, my name is Christopher Barrio Frojan and I'm the DOSI program officer, your host for today's webinar. This webinar is the first of six in the series and we're delighted to bring to you some leading voices in the field of deep ocean biodiversity uh, research, namely Paul Snellgrove from Memorial University in Canada, Muriel Rabone from the Natural History Museum in London, and Moriaki Yasuhara from the University of Hong Kong. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to today's presenters, and hopefully I'll see you again shortly when they have finished. Over to you. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, give me just a second to load up the presentation. All right, Chris, can you confirm that that is working? I can, yes, I see it, your presentation. All right, thanks. Well, thank you all for joining us and thank you, Chris, so much for spearheading this series, which I think is going to be really quite wonderful in terms of the diversity of talks we're going to hear over the coming year. So we're really pleased to have this opportunity to speak to you today. So thanks for joining us. A brief outline, I'm going to start things out by telling you a little bit about what's out there, an overview of deep sea patterns. Muriel will then go into challenges in assessing global biodiversity, species richness. And then Moriaki is going to talk about deep sea biodiversity and climate change, a paleo paleobiological view, and then other threats to deep sea biodiversity. Then I'll clue things up with the future of deep sea exploration, and from there we'll go into questions. So on that note, let's get going. So what's out there? An overview of deep sea ecosystems. So of course, uh, there's a long history of deep sea exploration, which uh, began with a whole lot of myths. Many different countries around the world have their myths. Uh, but of course, there's also mo real monsters. You can see uh, um, Alan Jameson here with a, a deep sea isopod over here on the right. This is a, a restaurant, I think in Taipei, serving up one of these uh, isopods uh, as opposed to the amphipods. And then of course, there are other creatures that, that in fact are really quite real and quite monstrous. Uh, but in fact, our exploration of deep sea ecosystems is relatively recent, and a lot of our effort has focused on the continental slope. So this is the, the region really between 200 meters and perhaps 4,000 meters. And the reason for this focus is, of course, ease of access. It's still difficult to sample this environment, but it is certainly a lot easier and a lot less time consuming than trying to go into the abyss or into the the deep ocean trenches. And so when we talk about the deep sea, of course, there's a whole range of different zones and habitats that you can see summarized on this slide. Um, but in fact, they encompass uh, most of the Earth's surface. So if we look at habitat greater than 1,000 meters, that includes about 78.5% of the global biosphere in terms of volume. Um, if we look at the ocean beyond the edge of the continental shelf, so let's set that at about 130 meters, that's really about 65% of Earth's surface. So it's really the dominant feature on our planet. These numbers are a little bit out of date, but I don't think uh, they really uh, have changed a whole lot for um, larger organisms. And by larger, I mean bigger than a third of a, a centimeter. We've only sampled about two square kilometers globally for the really small stuff, uh, which is less than a third of a, a centimeter. Um, we've sampled less than five square meters. So still lots of work to do. Some of the characteristics of deep sea ecosystems, first of all, the productivity is mostly supplied from surface waters. This results in very low biomass, low total energy input. There's quite large scale dispersal potential at least for propagules or adults. And so there are no real barriers to dispersal. There seems to be little spatial variation in habitat at first glance. And you can see this image in the background. And that also suggests relatively little three dimensional habitat complexity if we compare, for example, to coral reefs. Large, uh, large scale disturbances such as hurricanes and so on are relatively rare. So it's a, a relatively benign environment compared to most. And all of these features are really inconsistent with other really diverse habitats such as coral reefs and tropical rainforests. So again, if we look at uh, the food supply in the ocean, most of it comes from the surface waters because of course, most of the deep sea is pitch black. There's no sunlight, so no photosynthesis. The exception of course are chemosynthetic environments such as those uh, that support hydrothermal vent fauna, as well as cold seeps. But for the, for the most part, we're really talking about material imported from the surface waters that sink through thousands of meters of water before they hit the bottom. And so of course, what gets down there is a very small portion of what was initially uh, produced. So as a result, this is a, a very generic pattern, but what we see is that the abundances of animals, you see depth here along the horizontal axis, 
and numbers on the vertical or weight, you take your pick. In any case, numbers decline as you get deeper and deeper. And so this basic decline in biomass and number is really pretty common as a function of depth, with of course some exceptions. In fact, uh, now that we've explored more and more of the deep sea environment, we realize that there is quite a bit of habitat complexity, much more than we had initially realized. And so scientists so far have identified at least 30 different types of ecosystem in the deep ocean. And you can see some images of a few of them here scattered around on this particular plot. So um, in fact, it's not as benign and, and homogenous as we thought. There's really quite a bit of heterogeneity and that becomes an important part of our story in trying to understand and document deep sea diversity. And so uh, in terms of large scale patterns, there are a couple of studies that have done this sort of thing, looking at diversity, which is what expected species here. It's one of the metrics we use to look at diversity. And on this uh, graph, you can see latitude on the vertical axis. What you see is in the Northern hemisphere, there's, there's a bit of a whoops, excuse me, a decline uh, in diversity as you go further and further towards the poles. Uh, and so, um, uh, so, so what we see then is, is species richness tends to be highest towards the poles, uh, uh, highest towards the equator and lowest as you get towards the poles. This pattern is, is not nearly as clear when we look in the Southern hemisphere, uh, but it does vary depending on which taxa one looks at. Uh, and, and so there is some, some work to be done there. If we look at the relationship with depth or bathymetry, what you see on the horizontal axis here it is depth and again, diversity on the vertical axis. This hump shaped pattern has been documented in a variety of habitats, typically peaking somewhere around perhaps 2000 meters. That varies a little bit depending on the taxon as you can see, uh, but nonetheless, it seems to apply uh, in a whole variety of different ocean environments. If we look at the potential underlying causes of these sorts of patterns, uh, what you see here is this is particular to organic flux on the horizontal axis and diversity on the vertical axis. And so this is consistent with an idea that's been kicking around for many years that intermediate levels of disturbance, whether that's food input, uh, whether it's any other form of disturbance seem to favor biodiversity so that we see the highest diversity at intermediate levels of diversity. And so you see this in a whole variety of different systems. The other relationship that's been documented is one with temperature. And again, what we see here is a hump shaped relationship with the highest diversity at intermediate temperatures. So again, consistent with this idea of intermediate disturbance. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Muriel, who's gonna talk about some of the challenges in trying to assess deep sea diversity. Muriel. Great, thank you, Paul. And thank you so much everyone for, for tuning in for our, for our webinar. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna kind of shift focus a bit to some of the challenges of assessing deep sea biodiversity. And uh, I'm gonna start off by looking at what do we mean when we talk about biodiversity? And there's lots of ways that we can quantify and measure biodiversity. Um, a lot of these um, are underpinned by species is like a basic unit and um, there is a, a point to make here. Sorry, is how's my sound coming through? Okay, just getting yes, it there. is. Okay, cool. Um, is uh, species is a, it's a bit of a fluid concept, particularly in some groups. But uh, for the sake of simplicity here, we're going to be looking at species as a, as a primary unit of of biodiversity. Uh, next slide, thanks, Paul. Uh, well, what do we know uh, so far? Uh, we don't have a global estimate of deep sea biodiversity right now. Uh, we do know uh, we have two, over 243,000 species of current, um, that are currently recorded in the World Register of Marine Species Database. Uh, these are known named species. But there's a range of estimates uh, that was reviewed in, in this publication by Epitans in 2020. 12, uh, ranging from a few thousand to 10 million. And I'm not going to go into the where and why for of that, but uh, utilizing some of the analysis from Paul et al, the 2015 paper at the bottom, uh, we get an estimate of 90% unknown species. Uh, one thing to note, these publications are, you know, some of them are over a decade old now. And um, Paul, can we go to the next slide? Uh, yes, there hasn't there hasn't been a lot of movement in terms of uh, uh, the interim, and this is the publication 
but Kelly et al. from 2015 and looking at estimates across different biomes, and they haven't converged. Um, and really why we don't have an estimate of global biodiversity in the deep uh, feel is quite well summed up by this quote from Boy et al. Again, limited data. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to go into a few reasons why. Um, so yeah, next slide, please, Paul. Uh, well, a key challenge is sampling. And um, we do have uh, the tech and the tools. Um, it, we have it inaccessible there in quote marks because of this, but uh, expensive to mobilize, um, a lot of technical know-how. So as a result, we have uh, you know less than 1% estimated of the deep sea that's been explored. And we have a really diverse range of habitats uh, that Paul's spoken to earlier and, and taxa, and this is really um, impactful on, on sampling. And what we really need is uh, standardised sampling to be able to compare data over different surveys and, and cruise programmes. Next slide, please, Paul. Here we go. Uh, Right, well, I'm going to sort of look at the challenges in terms of a case study of a particular region that I am admittedly a little obsessed with, the Clarence Clipperton zone. And uh, this publication led by Eric Simon Ledo at, at the National Oceanography Centre uh, in the UK is uh, standardised a vast uh, collection of uh, ROV imagery uh, of megafauna morphotypes. Um, you can see some of them in the composite figure. And the clarence Clipperton zone is uh, the region shown in the map in the Central Pacific under exploration for deep sea nodule mining. And um, yeah, the highly heterogeneous environment, um, previous publications by, by Eric and others looking at vast, um, looking at diversity of, of habitat. Um, both at kind of macro and uh, micro scale. Um, but yeah, there's different habitat types like seamounts, rocky outcrops that have been much less studied than the abyssal plain region of the CCZ. It's really beautiful study by Eric, um, looking at these biogeographic provinces, identifying biogeographic provinces in the clarion Clipperton zone, um, driven by depth. So yeah, animals, um, child animals, um, Less common as you move uh, west, there's an east-west depth gradient in the clarence Clipperton zone. Uh, the main point really with this study is looking across different phyla and uh, looking across different areas within a, within a region, we can start to kind of shine a light on uh, some of these macroevolutionary patterns and um, uh, the macroecology and starting to answer some questions. And the study also found diversity with increasing depth. So really, um, uh, you know, this paradigm of, of lower diversity with, of, with uh, increasing depth, is, uh, this doesn't hold. And in, in, so that's a really interesting, um, uh, you know, New perspective on on deep sea ecology and in some of the one of the remarkable papers to come out of this region. Um, yeah, next slide, please, Mariaki. Sure. Yeah, and um, so the key challenge, another key challenge, really is um, where are the taxonomists, and this is something that's been well discussed um, for decades. And it's something that's really agnostic to any group or, or, or what have you. There's, there's the European Red List of, of, um, of insect taxonomists there, for example. And um, it's uh, taxonomy is challenging, time consuming. There's a paper out led by Philip Boucher recently, 20, uh, published this year. And this, um, uh, this uh, found average of 13 and a half years to describe one species. Um, okay, so we're flicking through, can we go back? Yeah, um, we have 
particular groups are more challenging. Small si sized organisms, those in the midwater, are very difficult to sample, but high diversity, um, abyssal plains, um, you know, the animals are rare uh, there uh, as well. A lot of singletons and cryptic species as well. Um, and this paper by Bonifacio Ameno describing species from the CCZ. And um, yes, that one isn't actually a cryptic species, but it was, um, uh, yeah, is a favorite. So that's, uh, these ones, this is a particular challenge as well. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Moriaki? Yes. It's already next slide on my screen, but maybe slow. Oh, okay. Um, it's a challenge to taxonomy slide, right? Number two. Okay. Huh. I'm still seeing the previous slide. How about mm. you, Paul? Are you? What are you seeing? Um, I'm oh. able to advance it as, as well, but I'm not sure I'm seeing yours, the same screen that everyone else is at this point. I'm seeing challenges to taxonomy phylogenetic uncertainty. Oh, weird. Okay. Um, oh, I'm seeing that now too. Okay. Great. Sorry, our sites don't want to play ball today. Um, okay, thank you so much. Yes, so phylogenies uh, in flux constantly being updated uh, so yeah this is a you know taxonomy is is um, you know constantly um, uh, you know things are being reshuffled all the time and uh, we have tools like meta barcoding and environmental DNA now with um, multiple species per sample and really useful tools but in the deep sea where most species aren't discovered and formally described um, it's a bit of an issue and um, what we need is to link to descriptions and have metabarcoding studies that are linked to specimen vouchers to make sure that they're, um, it, that they're reproducible. Um, next slide. Sure. Um, I think some people, we're getting a weird lag or something. It may be something to do with the I think this kind of, yeah. Okay, great. Um, right, so with all of these kind of extensive uh, use of molecular tools and, and biodiversity sampling, there's been a, an explosion of what this paper by Page calls dark taxa, which sequences not identified to species level, and extensive use of informal names. And these uh, temporary names uh, given to species um, prior to description. Um, can we the next slide, please? Yeah, now slide 23. Yeah, yeah 23, yeah. Um, okay, it looks like I've seen from the chat some people on slide 19. Um, Right, um, so the clarion clipperton zone, uh, so we've got a whole lot of, um, uh, okay. All right, so hopefully everyone is on site 23. I'm just gonna press on. Um, a lot of undiscovered species for the deep sea, vast habitats that haven't been sampled and for the discovered a lot haven't been formally described over 5,000 species from the clone Clipperton zone, for example, that's 90% undescribed, looking at those that are known. Um, so on the bar plot, name species in blue, and inform informal names in red, and some of the name species have been described from the region, shown in the, in the composite plot. And high numbers of singletons, so species known from a single location from a sole specimen. And can we have the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, I'll take you for. Oh, here we go. Yeah, um, okay. Yes, and why is this important? Right, well, because before, CCC is one of the, 
probably the best known abyssal plain regions, um, but there's key scientific gaps, which is um, pretty critical in the face of potential mining activities. Um, this paper led by Amon et al. And it was discussing the need to develop a roadmap for addressing um, the data gaps. So, um, okay. Right, yes, I do apologise. I have been having some internet issues as well today. So there's a lot of studies now from the current Clipperton zone where there previously hasn't been a lot of data. So this is uh, this example with some phylogenies, uh, some a species delimitation study of abyssal isopods and um, providing these data and knowledge that can be, you know, iteratively built upon is, um, you know, this is something that's, that's uh, after decades of very little data. Right. Um, so when you have an online checklist for the region, uh, that's of named species only, but this is, you know, a, a baseline of current knowledge that we can that we can build upon. And with this situation of, of thousands of informal names from the region, um, it's, it's time to start looking at some solutions to how to handle these in, in databases and publications. And there's a paper in PrEP led by Tammy Horton that's, that's looking at ways to utilize the worms infrastructure and, and start having a really robust system for this um, uh, for handling informal names. And yeah, one, uh, what is really critical is um, collaboration, um, really for, for addressing this, this um, these, these data gaps and, and the, these, uh, this, this, this big tackling this issue of describing um, species from the deep sea. And there's several programs that have recently been started. Um, ocean sciences, um, that is not deep sea specific, but it will be so that's going to be a large scale um, program for species discovery. There's the ISA Sustainable Seabed Knowledge Initiative and looking at um, descriptions for the CCZ. And the Singerberg Ocean Species Alliance as well, which is um, addressing, um, it, which is deep sea specific, and there's grant calls that are coming up. So yeah, it does feel like um, deep sea biodiversity is is having a having a bit of a resurgence. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunities and um, really to advance this work in in a collaborative and coordinated way. Yeah, um, thank you. And yeah, over to you, Mariaki. And apologies for the technical issues on my side. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us. Yeah, thank you very much. So I may a bit add uh, from uh, my paleobiological side of view, talking a bit about the uh, deep sea biodiversity and climatic change in usually a bit long time scale. So now slide 28 and going to slide 29 now. And uh, climatic impact on deep sea or deep sea biodiversity. Uh, you may think it's a bit too far away deep sea, super deep and the climatic change may not be too much matter, but it's not the case if we look into sediment core and the paleobiological record. This is just one example. The top panel is a climatic curve. Uh, this side value mean warmer climate and the lower side value mean colder climate. So we have a warm, cold, warm, cold, uh, beautiful glacial, interglacial climatic changes. And at the bottom is uh, the deep sea biodiversity curve reconstructed by paleobiological fossil record, uh, specifically on Ostracot Mayo fauna. And we have striking similarity between climatic curve and biodiversity curve. Uh, all warm climatic peak 
uh, highlighted by orange corresponds to biodiversity peaks in the bottom panels. And these two curves are basically showing quite similar trend. So climatic change affect not only shallow marine or uh, pelagic or surface ocean biodiversity, but also uh, have quite top-down effect for even deep sea biodiversity in like a 2,000, 3,000 meter depth. And uh, this is another example of NMDS. Uh, basically, the two-dimensional plot showing faunal similarity if plotted close together and faunal difference, it's uh, plotted uh, far away. And this is also sediment core result for the last 20,000 years. And different climatic time, like marine isotope stage two, is basically last glacial. And YD, younger Dryas, is uh, the glacial uh, cooling event, kind of abrupt cooling event. And the BA, boring alloyed, is a, a bit warmer time before younger Dryas. So different climatic states basically have quite separate faunal composition. They don't overlap too much, it indicating climatic change matter for faunal composition. So different climate have different faunal composition. And the next slide, number 31, is more summary or cartoonish picture. What will be happening or what happened in the past, present, future uh, climatic change on in general marine biodiversity. So the from the top to bottom, it's a polar temperate uh, tropical regions. And from left to right, it's a past, present, future. So from past to the future, temperature is going up. And red species mean hottest water adapted species, and orange mean intermediate warm temperature adapted species, and blue mean cold water adapted polar species. So they are basically tracking their temperature niche. So hot water species going up because tropical temperature is too hot even for them. And temperate species further going north or polar like Arctic region because of their temperature niche will be more comfortable in colder climate. And cold water species, they are unlucky because it's already highest latitude and coldest climate. So they may decline and in the future they may have high risk of extinction. And uh, one more thing is a tropical future could be empty. So even hottest adaptive species migrating forward to, to track their comfortable temperature. And uh, tropical temperature is uncomfortable for everybody. So it, future tropics could be kind of empty if we continue this climatic warming and the carbon dioxide emissions. So this is more general picture, uh, but the deep sea could have something similar, especially shallow deep sea, like several hundreds of meter. It's not surprising if we have the same. And more in general, deep sea is colder. So that means they may migrate not only to the pole, but also into the deep to have better comfortable temperature to track their thermal image. So this is already happening. Uh, not only in paleontological data we can see this, but also contemporary fishery data, at least shallow marine fishery data, already have this kind of uh, polar distributional shift in marine species. And as I bit mentioned, three-dimensional migration into deep, it could operate in deeper time too. So this is longer time scale cartoon like warmer climate, colder climate, uh, changing in millions of years. And <clears throat> you may focus on climatic, uh, cold climate on the right-hand panel. <coughs> we have colder temperature on the top panel, but it's not homogeneous through latitude. And polar temperature, like Antarctica or Arctic, have much stronger cooling than tropical temperature. We call this as polar amplification. So we have stronger latitudinal temperature gradient. So that means steeper thermal gradient with depth because we have deep water circulation. So cold temperature water in higher latitude going down into deep and moving into tropics to equator, uh, resulting a uh, vertical strong thermal structure. That means more variable niche for different species. So in colder climate, uh, you can see bottom panel 
of the right hand side, we see stronger latitudinal diversity gradient, more species in Equator uh, compared to warmer climate time. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the left hand side panel. So it's a bit long time scale, but still we are having climatic warming for the future. So a different mechanism may operate, but still we may see something similar, like less tropical biodiversity and less distinct uh, latitudinal diversity gradient in warmer future. And uh, not only climatic change, but also opposite could be problem. Uh, we do see uh, now working on uh, ocean-based climatic intervention impact on deep sea ecosystem. That one is uh, kind of summarizing uh, green engineering technique to fight against global warming climatic change like putting CO2 directly into deep ocean or deep ocean sediment and artificial upwelling, downwelling, and some uh, massive uh, particulate carbon putting into deep sea and also ocean ion fertilization experiment. It could be usable for fighting against climatic warming, but also can be big impact, negative impact on deep sea biodiversity and ecosystem. Basically, putting carbon means eutrophication in deep sea. That means less oxygen, potentially. So we should be careful. It's a true climatic change have negative direct impact on biodiversity. But also, this kind of, kind of rapid solution with technology could have negative impact too. So it's a bit difficult to decision, but we should be cautious about this kind of quick solution and make sure about uh, ecosystem impact assessment, for example, and also make sure it's quite, uh, it's really effective and also really good for long time, like a, at least decades or hundreds of years. Otherwise, if, for example, carbon dioxide going back to atmosphere just 10 years later, it doesn't do us to do, in my opinion. So this summary slide is just simple summary. So climatic change matter for deep sea biodiversity and fauna, and the species shift, uh, not only latitude uh, horizontally, but also vertically into deep or into shallow, uh, responding to climatic change. And also not only climatic change itself, but also technology to fight against climatic change uh, can be dangerous. So we need to be uh careful about that so we like to have a good bunch of discussion time after that so i have a bit more backup slide basically for uh food of the discussion uh it's not my slide but uh prepared by paul but uh, for example we have more things not only climatic change but also deep sea fishing and uh deep sea mining, it's increasingly common and technologically possible. And uh, climatic change, not only temperature, but also oxygen productivity, acidification, affecting deep sea ecosystem, we know already. And uh, the same. So yeah, in the future, we will have more mining exploitation, both fishery, and the minerals and uh, yeah, but it's important uh, because deep sea have really important function, for example, in carbon cycling. And also they have important service like a culture and amazing biodiversity. It's quite fun for us uh, to like marine environment or ocean as uh, not only scientists, but also uh, general public. So, we need to consider more about deep sea biodiversity. It may be still relatively unimpacted compared to shadow money ecosystem, but we should keep uh, deep sea biodiversity and ecosystem as natural as possible. I think this is the last slide and uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Hello. 
My name is Brandon Gertz, and I'm DOCI's Director of Communications. Thank you for joining us for these presentations on deep ocean biodiversity. There will be five more webinars in this anniversary series over the coming months, so I hope you'll tune in for as many as you can. Next on the agenda is a session on the United Nations BBNJ Agreement, highlighting its connections to the deep ocean and its implications for ocean governance. That webinar will be on December 6th at 1 p.m. UTC, and you can sign up at the link in the description below. Take care. Thank <music> you.